Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session. So in this session, we will be talking about um, streaming from multiple on-premises sources onto AWS. So uh, my name, obviously, is Mark, and here is Ravani. So what we'll be talking about today is how we are using log-based change data capture for databases. And Srivani will talk about what that all means for us. We will talk about scalable and secure replication onto AWS. Um, the customer story made it onto the agenda slide, but there is actually no slide on there. We do have a live demo at the end, which is always extremely exciting, uh, because things can go wrong in a live demo. So. Um, now, Srivani, these customers probably have lots of data residing in on-premises data sources. Um, they, could, they would want to, make the, to um, use the most efficient way to get the data onto AWS. How can they make sure that they don't lose any changes? Like, what's the best approach to get the data onto AWS? Right. So uh, it doesn't matter in the audience, you may be an application developer, a DBA, an architect. You know, you may have a distributed uh, data ecosystem. You know, some of your databases may be on-premises, legacy databases. And one of your biggest challenges is, like Mark said, is to ingest that data, streamline that into some sort of a data lake or a, a consolidated database into AWS. We have a lot of customers that are looking to get initiatives where streamlining data into AWS is one of the biggest problems. And how do they do that while the source systems are online without taking any downtime? And one of the key pieces of technology, and that's the core of what HVR does, is log-based change data capture. So uh, Mark talked about how do we make sure that while this application databases are online, we don't miss any transactions. We do that by pointing uh, HVR towards your database recovery logs. It takes a little bit of uh, you know, insight into the, any relational database architecture itself. One of the key elements is your log files, right? Log files you know, keep track of the sequence of events that happen, any kind of changes that were done to the database are kept in the log files. Auditing, um, uh, compliance, tracking user activities. But most importantly, if there is a database crash, the these redo logs or recovery logs aid in the recovery of the database to a previously known consistent state. So by using these log-based, uh, by using these recovery logs, we're able to kind of keep track of every single change that, that's been done to the database. So the key answer to your question mark is, because we're pointing to the recovery logs and replication or not, you know, consolidation or not, databases are always keeping track of what's happening. That's how we make sure that every change that's of interest to the, um, uh, to the data teams is important. That's how we get them to the consolidated data, data lakes. OK. So now. Um but in my database, um, we have multiple users uh, hitting the database at the same time, concurrent transactions. Everything um, hits the database. Like, how can you make sure that we get the transactions in order? And what, like, uh, how, how do you know that when, like, can we maintain consistency um, when we get the data to the destination? And that's most important, right? So you want to make sure your cash is deposited in the bank first before you run a withdrawal operation. So making sure that transactions are committed in the order that they were indeed committed in the source database is indeed critical. So again, walking back a little bit about, you know, these transactions are independent logical units. They are the ones that are making the changes. So uh, everybody here probably is aware of you know how transactions apply, right? You could have a transaction that hits a single table and affects multiple rows, or you could have affect, uh, independent transactions hitting a number of database tables at the same time. It doesn't matter. What's important is the sequence in which it's been committed to the source database. So uh, as you can see in this picture here, you have three transactions that are affecting a different set of tables, like in the earlier slide. They all started at a different time, but they're committed, at, committed in the database at a different time. So again, with HVR, we are using only the committed timestamps, the time at which each transaction was committed. That's what we take as the gold, uh, you know, and then that's how, that's how we commit on the target systems as well. What that gives you is we maintain the transaction consistency so we don't have 
long running transactions affecting the data consistency on the target side. So there you go. So because we use the um, commit sequence that happened on the source database and use that to replicate to the targets, that's how you make sure that the cache is deposited first before we withdraw it. Okay. Excellent. Well, very interesting, uh, Srivani. Now, <coughs> what if some of those, um, uh, some of the organizations, they, they already use an approach to change data capture? They already have, on all of their source database tables, they have a last modified date. And they use that date to filter the data. Um, they know when they last extracted the data, and now they uh, extract the data again uh, based on the last modified date. Like, is that a good approach? Or like, why would you recommend necessarily um, choosing a different approach? So change data capture has so many nuances to it, right? We're specifically talking about how HVR uses log-based CDC versus using the last update timestamp. So traditionally, I mean, ETL technologies have been around for a few decades now. That's not earth shattering at this day, in this day and time, right? So from that standpoint, you either have a column in your database tables that keeps a, uh, that is a timestamp column that you're using for you know, capturing the deltas, or you're creating a metadata column that captures the time, the commit time, and then using that for uh, capturing the changes. Either way, there is a little bit of a cost associated. The cost is much more significant if you're looking at you know, enterprise scale workloads. And I, I'm not very familiar with what the audience is here, but if you have any sizable amount of data you're moving over wide area, wide area networks, consolidating into the likes of AWS, you know, you're moving large amounts of data at any given point in time. From that standpoint, can your select statements, the you know, last time timestamp or not, can your select statements that extract you know, millions of rows of data be moved over the network efficiently? That's a question. That's a downside with the traditional ETL processes being applied in today's scenario of replicating to the crowd over you know, network bandwidths that are come at a premium cost. Also, again, it goes back to the impact to the source systems, right? Your applications are critical for your business. The last thing you need is your BI queries, analyst queries, taking down your source system. We actually were talking with a customer, Progressive Leasing, uh, a great customer of ours. Uh, the developer there was joking, saying, any query that hits a source database and runs over 60 seconds from the BI team, that gets killed by the source system DBA. So they consider every BI query as non-mission critical. So can you afford that cost? Can you afford that application performance cost is another consideration you would have to see. Again, going back to the network cost, right? So if you're moving data and you've got these spikes, you know, it's a cost now associated that you have to pay to the cloud providers also. Most importantly, if you are tracking any kind of historical data, that's lost because you're only capturing the final state of your, um, of your data with the traditional ETL processes. So alternatively, uh, we're talking about log-based CDC, how, how that's more efficient in moving data. With log-based CDC, number one, you're not hitting the source systems. Your source database tables are left alone other than for an initial data load, and I'll talk about that in just a second. The second bit, you're only moving what has changed in an individual transaction. So your, your data movement is much more agile and nimble, moving over the network. And because only committed changes are being moved over, you know that you're using your network, network um, in a much more optimal way. With HVR, I'll talk about that in the specific context of HVR, we moved compressed data, so we make your bandwidth much more amplified compared to moving you know, millions of rows of data at the same time. Again, because we're streaming changes as they come in, we are capturing historical information, which is in contrast with what we use in uh, traditional ETL processes. All right, so now, Srivani, of course, we're at the AWS event. <laughs> so um, naturally, everybody wants to know what kind of technologies can we utilize on AWS. We, we, we have all these on-prem data sources. We want to go into AWS. We often see data lakes, data warehouses to move first. What kind of technologies um, does HVR support in AW on AWS? Yeah, I think that's, that slide in itself is mostly self-explanatory. From our perspective, the core of the technology is in capturing the changes from the source systems. 
If you were to think about the variances of the likes of Oracle Database, SQL Server, Postgres, uh, DB2i series, LUW, uh, on mainframes, for example, the, the, the proof of the, the, the value of the solution is in, able, in the ability to reverse engineering the logs across this host of technologies. And that's what we specialize in. From a replication into, which is a target perspective, we really can replicate into anywhere. Specifically with AWS, we can support replication into the likes of Redshift, any hosted um, RDBMS by Amazon, uh, Snowflake on AWS, for example. But again, that's only a limited set that you see here. The uh, HVR is built on a, um, a hub and spoke architecture on the principles of distributed computing. So you can add a number of spokes for a single hub. And I know, Mark, you have something coming up that you'll talk about that in a second, too. Now, I have a question for you, Mark. We're talking a lot about log-based CDC, right? Sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about use cases. You've been around data replication for what, 25 something years, right? I'm <laughs> aging, I'm dating you a little bit here, but, um, but you've done this for years now. Customers are no longer moving small, small amounts of data, right? They're moving enterprise data. How do, what are some best practices in your experience you've seen when source systems are the likes of eBusiness Suite or SAP systems, which are much more complex? I'd love sure. to hear what you think. Yeah, absolutely, and that's, um, uh, so indeed, we, we come across a lot of uh, complex enterprise data. Um, organizations want to consolidate data, often from multiple instances of some of these enterprise uh, databases into, um, <coughs> into their data lakes, into their data warehouses. Um, and for those kinds of systems, of course, these systems run on a traditional relational database, an HR with the log-based um, change data capture that Srivani explained, we can, of course, capture the data out of the tables. For most of the um, enterprise applications, that is enough to be able to understand the data on the destination side. SAP, however, is an exception. Um, SAP, the most uh, commonly deployed SAP version these days, or SAP um, edition, if you like, is the enterprise core components, ECC. And it has a number of tables, in fact, some of the most important tables that are of a, the kind of so-called cluster or pool tables. And these kinds of tables are very difficult for an, for an application to deal with because the bulk of the data resides in an encoded and compressed format in the base tables in the database. So uh, a technology like HER, it can do log-based change data capture all day long. It gets data in a compressed and encoded format. We still need to make it valuable to the organizations. And the way we do that is by decoding that data um, somewhere else, away from the SOAR system, because of course SAP systems, Oracle Business Suites, PeopleSoft applications, etc. Some of these applications run large volumes, um, very busy transactional systems. So to get the to minimize the impact on the system, like you explained, the way we want to do that is to um, decode that data uh, distributed away from the source system. So that's um, a technology that we provide. SAP Transform is what we call it. Um, as we talk about the HER technology, we also like to talk about the fact that we provide an end-to-end -end solution for data integration. So whilst CDC is the most important part, it's not the only part. We do um, also the initial data load, uh, of course, the CDC, but then we also provide data validation as well so that you can go into your system at any point in time and validate whether the current state of the data on the source matches the state on the target. And that's the data validation. And we can even do that against uh, data um, that resides in cluster and pool tables in the SAP as well. So I think all in all, this is a great um, approach to unlock some of that um, enterprise data that resides in, in relational databases still. So volume and scale are good, right? But you are the chief security officer for HVR. What are some concerns your customers or our customers have come forward with in terms of security of data transfer? I mean, that's the key concern for many organizations. 
What are some things you may have recommended that resonated and what are some pain points customers may have expressed in your experience? Yeah, uh, absolutely, uh, that's a great question. So, the, um, so what we see a lot is the, um, <coughs> is, is, uh, the, the, the challenge of opening up firewalls. That is certainly a challenge, plus the fact that data gets transferred over the public internet. So how do organizations deal with that or how do we recommend they deal with that? So the, um, the approach uh, from HR's perspective is that there is a central installation, a control environment that we refer to as the hub, and that hub will always initiate the communication. So uh, from a hub perspective, I need to be able to communicate to the destination uh, the destination doesn't necessarily have to communicate back. Um, you mentioned the distributed architecture. Um, so with our distributed architecture, we have flexibility in where we deploy individual components. So you might choose as an organization worried about opening up the firewall into your on-premises data center. You may choose to deploy the hub component in an on-premises system so that you only need to open up the firewall into the cloud and not from the cloud into your on-premises data center. Um, that is, um, a lot of our customers um, use that kind of approach, and that is certainly a common concern. For those customers who do um, agree to open up the firewall into the on-premises data center, we often use a proxy so that we don't have to open up the firewall to every individual production system, and that way we can then pass the data across. Then additionally, um, of course, encryption on the wire, very important. We always will recommend that when there's cloud environments involved. And then uh, lastly, uh, authentication is important. Get unified authentication and make it arguably very difficult for any program other than HR to authenticate, use two-step verification in the process. Those are the common concerns from a security perspective. So can we, can we at this point transition to the demo? And while you're doing yeah. that, Mark, I recommend the audience, we love a dialogue. You know, we'd love to share what our product can do, but if you want to share any questions and concerns right after the demo, there'll be some time. We're happy to take questions. We'd love engagement from the audience as well. Excellent, yes, and here we are in the demo. So this is a setup, it's absolutely live. Um, so it, here we're looking at the perspective of a hub, right? So one of our control centers, and we see that there are multiple data flows on this diagram. So I've got an eBusiness Suite uh, system at the top left, then I have a Postgres RDS database, and I have an SAP system at the bottom left, and those systems, there's data flowing. As you can see, there's a bit of animation on the, on the chart. There's data flowing uh, from the eBusiness Suite system into a Postgres Aurora instance, but also into S3 as a data lake. We can capture the data once and deliver it into multiple destinations. And then from SAP, likewise, it's going into Snowflake on the one hand, and then also into S3. So <clears throat> this gives me a great overview of what's going on. I can, I can get some information here about latency, about volume. So all of this on the chart makes some sense. And if I want to drill down into some of the details, I can click on one of these charts and I can pop up what the current latency is for this environment. Now we keep a lot of that historical information around as well. So if I then subsequently go and look at some of my charts, I can see how over time the latency has evolved, how the volumes of data on the tables have evolved. So there is some interesting information. I can hover the mouse over the chart and I can look at individual um, details as of a particular data point. And a lot of this interesting information is here available in a time series format where I can go in and say, well, okay, I want to know like, what were some of the transaction volumes on my data when I had some increased latency, for example. So this is a great way to explore um, what our, um, really what our data um, replication, our data volumes have looked like, like over time. So, net net, um, HVR, log based CDC solution. We were built on distributed process, principles of distributed processing over a hub and spoke architecture. 
We, are, we help customers achieve real-time data replication from anywhere to anywhere. Um, you know, uh, inbuilt compression, encryption, and most importantly, data validation. Even when your source system's under load, out of the box you get all the key functionality. We want to wrap up here and we, we really would love to have a deeper conversation at booth 1331. Uh, but at this point, I guess we have a few minutes, a minute or two, if there's any immediate questions that we can answer while we're on stage here. Yes, and if you'd like to raise your hand, if anybody has any questions, I will happily bring you the microphone so everybody can hear the question. Yep, we got one right here. Hi, thank you. I didn't see all the data sources that you do. Is Sybase one of them? Sybase is in, in works right now. It's in the works. And uh, does it have to go on, uh, in AWS? Can you go on-prem replication? Yes, we okay. can. OK, thank you. Anybody else? So I heard about uh, making a copy from on-prem to AWS. Do you do the reverse also? Yes, that was the question. We do. Okay. Reverse replication yeah. is possible so as well. I didn't hear. Thanks. No problem. Yeah, the common use case in that regard is um, migrations as well, where you might want to have a safeguard post-migration that you keep your on-prem environment around for a few months or so, replicate back so that if for whatever reason post-replication the application doesn't perform as well as it should, you always have a way to go back without losing a lot of changes. So, yeah, also, a lot of customers still have their on-premise data warehouses that they still want to stand up new applications in the cloud and then consolidate back into the data warehouse. So in addition to that, there's multiple use cases that require that kind of replication back into on-prem. More questions? Sorry, yeah, one more. Can you also change the data when you get to your target destination? Is it possible? Transformation, you mean transform? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is some lightweight transformation capabilities, but with HVR, our focus is to make sure there is a consistent copy on both sides. When you're offloading for reporting or whatnot, we want to make sure the data is consistent on the source and target. But yes, there are some lightweight transformations that we can do. All right, we've got one more. Uh, regarding the hub, is that uh, clustered for HA, or how do we handle um, you know, that being down and lost transactions going to it? Yeah, absolutely. So for HA, indeed, we recommend a clustered approach to the hub itself, yeah. All right, I think we're all set. Are we all set? We are all set. OK, set. great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you, Shivani and Mark. And again, their booth number is 1331, 1331, if you would like to check them out.